Welcome everyone to this working paper presentation. May I request everyone except the speakers to please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the meeting. Um, any queries or comments that you have may be typed into the chat box. They will be read out after the speaker and speaker's presentation and the discussion's comments. I request Professor G. Arunima to please take over the proceedings. Um, on behalf of uh, the Kerala Council for Historical Research, we are delighted to welcome all of you uh, to the working paper presentation series, uh, which is kickstarting today with Aparna Ishwaran's uh, talk, uh, Speaking in Many Tongues. Um, Aparna completed her PhD uh, and she defended her thesis. Uh, in 2018 from the Center for Women's Studies uh, in JNU. Um, the same year, she was awarded uh, a fellowship by the Kerala Council for Historical Research to revise her thesis into a book. Uh, the paper that she's presenting today is a part of that um, fellowship that was uh, awarded to her. And this is one of the expectations that the KCHR has of our fellows who are granted this fellowship. So we are very happy that um, not only has Aparna managed to do a first draft of her revision, uh, but also that she ha is here today to present this work uh, so that we can actually learn and discuss uh, this paper. She was additionally awarded a postdoctoral fellowship for, by the Indian Council for Social Science Research in 2019. Uh, and that postdoctoral fellowship continues her work that she had started on war poetry in Sri Lanka and looking at women poets, but it extends the scope of that research. Um, we are also very honored to have Dr. V. Padma, uh, known to a large number of us as Mangai, uh, a very well-known um, writer, playwright, and theater activist and feminist uh, from Tamil Nadu. Um, uh, she will actually respond to Aparna's paper today. But before we start today's proceedings, um, I want us to remember a great scholar and a very dear friend, somebody who was part of our lives as part of not just the scholarly community, but the large world of the women's movement and women's friendships, um, Professor Malati Dialvis, a Sri Lankan scholar, a social anthropologist, from Sri Lanka, who has done profoundly serious work in the past three decades. She passed away this morning at 1 a.m. after having battled cancer for the past three years. Um, Mala's passing has been heartbreaking for large numbers of us who were lucky to have counted her as one of our friends. Uh, we also learned enormously from her, her work on motherhood, her work with uh, Kumari Jayavardhana, on looking at the mother's movement in Sri Lanka, um, and also her very, very layered and nuanced work on violence, uh, where she brought all kinds of new insights, including uh, in her more recent uh, work, thinking about the visual in relation to violence. So please let us take one minute to remember Mala. Uh, on this day when we have our paper presentation on Sri Lankan war poetry.
could we start now aparna yes ma'am thank you um thank you kesi char um for this opportunity and thank you um professor arunima for that um introduction um i just got to know about passing away of um maldi de alves whom i know through my mentor and supervisor um g arunima and um i had met her when i had gone to sri lanka and it is really shocking for me um um okay so um the paper that i'm going to present here today is titled speaking in many tongues the articulation of violence in the poetry by tamil women in sri lanka uh let me at um, the onset make my positionality and my identity very visible i'm a i'm a researcher from kerala with very tenuous links to tamils uh in sri lanka i'm led uh, to this work with poetry thinking and forming ide- ideas based on research and writings coming mostly from the vernacular medium marginalized in the academia and through thinkers and researchers and academicians still writing from the space uh, of violence with continuously pecking at him pecking at them so i am an outsider of the language and the experience and this work is thus a work of translation with all its inherent pitfalls secondly the historical period that is a uh, held to scrutiny in this paper is bookended by two brutal events of erasure uh, the years that are, are between 1981 and 2009 on june 1 1981 the famous jafna public library was set on fire by the police forces of sri lanka the library which housed 97000 volumes innumerable manuscripts and invaluable archival material was reduced to a pile of ash between a sunset and the next sunrise an important part of the cultural history of the tamil people was incinerated as if to confirm heinrich heine's words where they have burned books they will end in burning human beings a period of much bloodshed and violence followed this brutal act of arson terrible atrocities were committed on the civilian population of sri lanka through the next 30 years of civil war by both parties involved in the war the sri lankan state forces and the ltt the scale and nature of this conflict reached its horrific zenith in the period between january 2009 and may 2009 at the end of which the sri lankan government declared its victory over ltt the final stage of the war which came to a bloody halt in mulivaikal was infamously dubbed by the media as a war without witness however poetry as a mode of witnessing war can be traced in the works written by tamil during the period since the publication of the widely read maranthul varvum published in 1983 we will live amidst death which inaugurated what could be called a genre of poetry of political protest which included poets like cheran jayapalan aravindan and ahilan various anthologies and collections of poems have appeared in sri lanka written by tamils the poetry produced in this period is marked by the important events during the war and the act of writing through it yet these poems are not ordinary records of important events it is a collection of multiple responses differing views different experiences that shun the objectivity of a singular history it also bears the struggles of confronting a world marked with the brutality as well as banality of wartime violence my work tries to look at poetry as being in conversation with the various experiences that marks an existence through a war which was usually and frequently termed as being fought over competing nationalism I ask how does poetry act as a witness to women's experience of war in the period 1989 1981 to 2009 a period which is also crucial to the Tamil nationalist movement however the past has to be witnessed through the prism of the present and the present in Sri Lanka is not devoid of violence though the war was brutally brought to an end the violence faced by Tamils faced by Tamils and Muslims in Sri Lanka still continues One of the insidious ways in which the violence has been perpetuated is through the deliberate acts of erasure of the history of Tamil people's struggle 
and through official interdictions on memory and remembering. The wounds have not healed. In fact, it has not been allowed to be healed with intentional, insensitive displays of power, literally bulldozing monuments in memories of the hurt and the marginalized. A person or a community devoid of memory and history and identity, as poets note, are walking corpses already, already dead. Yalini Yogeshwaran, poet from Jaffna in the post-war period, writes poignantly in Uraru, ask them if they know the story which they claim have ended to has ended before. Many episodes and subplots of it still exist here. She continues to write, even if I am dead, give me back my identity alive. Give me back my identity alive and I shall survive. But sadly, it is exactly the erasure of identity, which is the violence, which is the violence faced by Tamils in Sri Lanka today. The end of the war meant a censure of another sort in the name of moving on and a rhetoric of development. The burden again fell on the Tamils to forget the past, to accept reconciliation and move on so that Sri Lanka can concentrate on rebuilding and economic development. Tamils' right to remember their suffering and loss has been taken away from them in an insensitive and flagrant erasure of any remnants of the violent past that they suffered, which is termed by Sumati Shiva Mohan, artist, poet and academician, as the aesthetics of triumphalism. For example, the massacre ground in the last days of war in Nandikadal Lagoon today houses a resort called the Lagoon's Edge. The war bunkers, the home of erstwhile LTT Supremo, Prabhagaran were turned into army sites as well as tourist sites with soldiers um, offering tea and samosas. This prompted Gauri Koneshwaran, a queer Tamil American poet, performing artist, teacher and lawyer whose family immigrated to the US from Sri Lanka, write a poet, poem titled How to Enjoy a Vacation to a Country that Says It Won the War. The poem is written in forms of bullet points, a few of which I shall read. She writes, While planning your journey, accept that ethics are not included in the price of your ticket. Tell yourself your, current re your currency is helping the country. Do not question government control of the tourism industry. Never ask why killing fields have been converted into resorts run by the military. Learn the dominant language, which translates war criminals into heroes. And she ends by saying, define tourist as none of this involves me. Take photos of every sunset. Always have your passport handy. Keep your conscience secure in the hotel safe. It has to be noted that the systemic destruction was not just of LTT memorials, or Tuilum Illams, but also the statues, the pillars, gardens constructed by local residents, the civilians to remember civilian deaths, remember their loved ones. These were also destroyed. The latest being the sudden demolition of a memorial in the Jaffna University campus at the start of this year, which was constructed to remember, which was created to remember Tamil civilians killed during the last part of the war. Sindhujan Varadaraja an upcoming academician from Germany writes, Our past became a subaltern memory and an antagonist history. Where does such memory go to rest? But even in this moment of erasure of identity, the burden was on the Tamils to make peace. There were widespread concerns that the Tamils revisiting and remembering the horrors of the past will lead to a revival of the militant nationalism. Recently, in an online interview given to Nam Tamil radio channel, poet Avvai had recited an unpublished poem of hers titled Pudai Kuligal or Burial Pits. She read, Roads devoid of people, dense forest, thorny bushes, ditches and hill valleys, abandoned wells are all renamed and have become burial pits. The disappeared, the abducted, the lovers of liberation, the descenders, have become the buried bodies. She continues to write, Those who have lost everything, 
their curses shall slaughter those who have lost everything their curses shall slaughter a listener immediately responded saying we shouldn't go back and talk about what happened and their escalate violence to which avai had calmly responded this is our history we can forgive but we cannot forget it is here in this moment of continuing violence in the present that we listen to the poetry witness written by women which are registers and texts of memory which articulate violence not just in its spectacular horrific and bloody excess of killing and murdering but also in its everydayness in its banal repetitiveness in its utter lack of meaning an articulation of violence as the structuring the spine behind being tamil in a majoritarian sinhala but to sri lanka here violence is of course encountered in its debilitating force capable of annihilating everything in a blink of an eye but also in its slow eating away of the at the soul in the daily defeats it serves but mostly in this poetry witness violence is also constituting new identities leading to the inauguration of new modes of survival of resistance determined smuggling of descent and self food by former um, sorry determined smuggling of descent and self food by forming new safer spaces new ways of solidarity let me start with the period between 1981 to 1987 which saw the tamil suffer from unspeakable violence including the infamous 1983 anti tamil riots termed as black july this was however also a period of mass joining in the tamil movements the yakam and here and hence was marked with sense of optimism and assertion of tamil identities in the imagination of a homeland eram there were active debates and discussion on the nature of the polity the culture the gender relations which which will occupy this new construct waiting to be formed led by the youth the time was imbued with a vigor and a fearlessness emblematic of youthful energy and is marked by the reimagination of tamil society even as it is engulfed in violence from outside women join national movements like eros ltt plot epilrf among many many other groups there was um um independent women's groups were formed a lot of new ma- women's magazines were being published um it it was a period of hope and um and energy and vigor as somadi shivamohan writes the national liberation struggle destabilized hierarchical structures of class caste and particularly gender at this point here she traces the formation of a space for militant consciousness to emerge which she opposes to the militarism of the later 1980s when ltt comes into dominance It was this period that produced in 1986 an important anthology of women poets titled Solla the Sedigal edited by Sitrilega Maunaguru who herself is a poet writing under different pseudonyms of Shangari and Chandrika She will go on to be known as an exceptional academician a professor in Eastern University known for equally for her activism as well as her interventions in peace and her writings her nuanced exploration of gender and the figure of woman in tamil nationalism has been the bedrock on which this work has also could even begin the anthology brought together 13 women poets some of them who became well known in the coming years in the following years like urvashi selvi shivaramani sanmarga avvai among others maunaguru writes in the introduction to this collection that this work espouses a new awareness by women of themselves their bodies their lives and their role in society this literary production was facilitated by women's movements attached to the growth of national movements as i mentioned earlier the pingal alvatam or the women's study circle composing of women in and around jaffna university provided a an atmosphere of discussion and debate as v gida writes In this anthology, we can trace an emergence of a tentative feminism arching its way out of a blasted yet dramatic space. Um, it is very interesting because I w- uh, was listening to the um, interview by Avay, and she had mentioned how women were both part of um, this um, these study circles and women's only groups, and they would have these intense debates where nothing was out of um, bounds. they would have uh, intense debates 
and they would take whatever they were they had discussed to um, the respective movements they were part of where again there will be def- um, debate and dissent and they will bring back um, whatever they have um, and the the arguments they have encountered there to sharpen their um, their argument better she talks about how sitrilega mauner guru had come out with a small pamphlet where um, in tamil translated into tamil was feminist texts and it was um it was sort of they took it to the nalu temple and distributed among common people and then uh, listened to their um their reactions and then um, then came back and decided and debated on how to tackle these concerns or um sometimes misconceptions so uh in the poems that are included in this um in solada seedigal we can trace an effort in listening closely to the language of silence and turning those unspoken things to active speaking beings most of these poems are written in first person and have voices of women who are speaking of the inconsistencies underneath the deceptive even surface of the tamil society at that time united in the purpose of tamil nation for example a shankari in her poem in their eyes sets the tone to the collection this is the first poem and writes i have no face heart soul in their eyes two breasts long hair slight waist broad hips is all i have cooking spreading beds bearing children are my task they will talk about chastity of kannagi and while they talk so they'll keep on looking at my body this is habitual starting from husband to shopkeeper The evocation of Kannagi in this poem is very pertinent, considering the cultural cons- currency that this figure from the Tamil epic Silapadi Karam has in the Tamil society. She is the icon of the ideal Tamil uh, womanhood who takes on a Pandian king and questions him on justice and burns the city of Madurai in revenge for her husband's unjust death because of the purity of her chastity. Purity or cutpu of woman. is the cornerstone of tamil cultural and moral regulation in constructing who is the ideal tamil woman especially in the future elam sumadhi shivamohan writes that the understanding of cutpu in sri lanka is mediated and received from various cultural and popular mediums like south indian cinema including south indian cinema she traces to kannagi an antecedent to the notion of cutpu which is later used to mobilize women into tamil nationalism in jaffna society kannagi she says is not regarded as a real woman but a saintly figure as well as a goddess yet her cut her that characteristic is considered unmythical real which real women should also emulate sumati shivamohan rightly opines opines that the martial revenge of kannagi on the city of madurai is conveniently forgotten and the mythical power of chastity is remembered and propagated throughout the poems for example ranga's poem unmail munmai which talks of sexual violence of a woman at the hands of a man who belongs to her same ur ur or ur uravin uh, ur has me which means um, natal village carries connotation of home in ta- as well an assumption of shared love and affinity which is what ranga was um, attacking or taking to question the fixity of this idea which was da- which was being dismantled through the wor- uh, words of the woman who was undergone rape from an uravin the uh, truth which is more than truth that she says is 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 that um the truth that exceeds the common sense of community the unspeakability of violence against women that's inherent within communities the poems also are at 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 the, sometimes take a very effective tone they are addressed to missing lovers um but they always always end with a feminist consciousness um uh, for example shangari's idai veli which is um uh, the poem starts addressing the lover but ends by saying what can i do i am a woman liberated how can you reach the heights i occupy or um avvais um uru thoriyin kural which which remem- uh, reminds us of that one enlightened friend we or uh, we have who badges us to wake up and see the light where she says why are you still in the dark she say irundu va ulage par see the world maitrey talks of how tasks tax like chast- 
people saying that oh how chaste you are like kanagi or how good you cook the cooking star or how thin and beautiful are you are she said these are not praises these are golden chains please woman um see it for what it is um so this was written in the 1980s and um when after almost 21 years another more comprehensive anthology of women poets pale manakum bolude from ilang um which um which was pay painstakingly collected and published at the height of war in sri lanka by a mangai she writes of sollada seedigal as putting forward women's voice in a different tonality and interweaving of the personal with the political so while the women are sometimes talking of deeply personal memories and experiences they are always simultaneously talking of the outside political violence as well in the afterword to the same anthology we geeda terms this as the interweaving of the thinais the agam and the puram and examining the inner work which is basically examining the inner workings of the outer world and the outer tremors of the inner world she traces an absence of the same in the writings of women coming from tamil nadu at that period however she says the later generation of women starting to write uh, during the 2000s especially about body politics and deeply political uh, in their outlook has what she called a nandi kaden or a debt of thanks to uh, to give to sollada seedigal In 1990s with the past struggle between militant groups yielding to dominance of a single militant group which is ILTT the poetry of women also changed in its tenor on one hand there was the poetry of women combatants like ambuli captain bharathi captain vanadi etc and um which which is marked by the persistence of heroism it is interesting as they wrote of what moved them to shoulder guns and like we geeta says writes um also talks about the tra- tragic freedom that they experienced which was linked to their abilities to wield guns this is even in the poetry which is published after after war like um, unnamed star period other natchatirangal um also you you can see uh, the this uh, there's a lot of things that the uh, combatant women talk about uh, it's it's not usually usually there is i'll get to that point so there is a very engaging debate on the agency of women uh, combatants which i don't want to get into right now but in the reasons given for women turning into wielders of violence especially as part of the elite black su- black tiger suicide squad there were insinuations that this must be because she has gone through sexual violence the so basically saying the violence embodies embodies the woman with a subjectivity that demands revenge and uh, revenge and more violence i fall back on the nuanced analysis provided by uh, sitrilega maunaguru on the construct of the raped woman that at once evidences tamil society's moral anxiety to protect and police women's body but also at the same time shows the helplessness encountered by civilians by the rampant use of sexual violence as an instrument of war um nilofer demel has a uh, has done extensive work on it she talks how um she does um um address the morality of ltt and um their um, injunctions on women sexuality but she also talks about how when danu uh, who killed rajiv gandhi um uh, there were rumors going around that she was a rape victim of the ipkf uh, mauna guru equates this this re- uh, revenge story with the ritual of agni pravesham or what she calls self purification so the self purification for the raped woman to be an ideal tamil woman again would be to erase herself through taking revenge um this was also the period that we as indian should be deeply ashamed of the period when ipk of ipkf under the garb of peacekeeping was was uh, a perpetrator of another a deeply sexual uh, of violence of all nature um which led to people uh, right um, ex combatants like banu bharathi right very difficult to read poems like vedi kundu pisaham uh, pandavar and kalas konnishwarigal these are all difficult re- readings because we have we come to come uh, come to face to face the violence we are capable of in war time Konishwari was a Tamil woman gang raped and murdered by security forces in 1997 in Ambare district. She was visited by security forces at her house and after the brutal rape was killed by throwing a grenade into her genitals. And it's the same um violence given in graphic detail that we can see in Kalas Konishwari Konishwarigal 
also but what i was interested in is was how how there is a plurality of um, or a community of women being thought about with the center being the woman who has been violated so it's not a kunishwari but it's kunishwari girl and here i am drawn to aryal's um, excellent po uh, poem mannam perigal which i want to read out it is okay we have seen it on many mornings during our frequent travels at the edges of street fences or at the intersection of four roads it takes many forms shape shifting into dog bear or wolf eagle cat or buffalo with its lifted leg beside a telegraph post it stares at me it must be many days since that animal slept its eyes speak aloud of a creature unknown to me the avid hunger in those eyes make me aware of an unknown tongue i a refugee in this country walk past telling myself that this must be the violin language that beautiful manimperi and arkuneshwari heard recognized in the midst of my sleep that night after the day's frenzy roaming and its mental anguish i too recognized the same the very same deeply embedded language of violence beside me my husband lay his breath cooling ah uh, so in 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 these poems the rape of the woman um has led to a speech which cannot be simply accommodated within the registers of revenge instead the instead of exclusion and spectrality of the lone raped woman the multiplicities of violence and responses are highlighted um the poems in the poems the writers identify themselves with the violated woman um this especially at a time when acknowledgement of sexual violence was very difficult in sri lanka and when it was also the attacks were sometimes also message crimes as um said in suban's anthology message crimes in the sense that warning women by deliberate attacks uh by attacking uh, women who have joined movements it's basically saying the 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 woman who who joins the movements will be raped I want to read this along with Tamilini's um, memoir. Tamilini, who headed LTT's Women's Political Div uh, Division, her memoir is titled "In the Shadow of the Sword." There has been acknowledgement in international fact-finding missions, Human Rights Commission reports, etc., that rampant use of sexual violence was committed in the torture of the surrendered Tamils at the end of the war, in the immediate end of the war. Tamarini however denies that she had to go through any of this via such violence and she in fact talks about the ill effects of such insinuation that women under detention has had to go through sexual violence and how it adversely affects the life of the woman who gets out she is also deeply hurt at the society which couldn't come up come to terms with the surrendered combatant the society which kept uh, kept asking her why didn't she buy the cyanide capsule after quote what she had to go through so here what you see is that either you speak out and become uh, and speak out or take revenge or you erase yourself while i was reading this i thought that first i thought it was the vestiges of ltt's morality surviving in tamil nadu's denial of violence But then I read Shivadi Shumohan talk of how silence or denial of sexual violence is not always victimhood. She terms this refusal to acknowledge the violence one has been subjected to as the untelling of the act, a choice that reveals the violence committed by the society on women before and after the act. So even the act of not telling is um an as a political act. She also draws upon the work she has done on uh. um women who surrendered at the end of the war and also tamil kavi's um novel called uri kalam where um the last days of war the journey from what was their home to their enemy's territory is mapped out women had to uh, have talked about walking naked relieving themselves on the seashore seashores but it's it's shown as an act of survival of gazing back there is no shame but but this is an active act of survival she contrasts this with the war footage of trophy videos taken by sinhala soldiers of mutilated bodies like that of isa priya who was who was um in the press wing of ltt um similarly at the same time 
there was also a, a tract of poetry which recognized the tragic and violent turn of the national struggle in its militant phase. We, we see how violence is noted as a loss of control over one's time. There is a, there is a, um, they're trying, the women are trying to uh, conceptualize wartime as, as also a temporal shift that was hard to adapt to, but more difficult to explain. Poetry with its lack, with its lack of narrative closure became the chosen medium. For example, Shivaramani's um, very famous poem, Oppressed by Nights of War, marks the time of war through the changes in the experiences of childhood, where she says that how um, children have forgotten to play hopscotch and to make temple cards from palm fruit uh, shells. But now what they learn is to shut the gate in good time and to listen when the dogs bark strangely. Maitri's uh, poem talks about uh, this mother who is at, who, who, whose um, husband has uh, uh, has gone missing or has disappeared and how she has to leave, um, make sure that the doors are closed, but make sure also that the, um, the door behind is sometimes left open and how can she talk about how these reversal of um, circumstances has happened to a young child. Urvashi's poem called Their Night, where she graphically describes the pain of witnessing an event like the capture of a loved one. She talks about the loss of their days and nights as being claimed by violence. So she says how when the husband is, uh, the lover is taken away, um, the, ch uh, the child, it's very disturbing um, narration. The child at my feet screamed, neighbors gathering in curiosity. He walked away with them and she continues to say, the impression made in me by the hands bearing 50 rifles made a bur burden of sorrow that night was there. This. Um, this was also the period of the exodus of Muslims from their homes in uh, northern Sri Lanka, termed as traitors, leading to poetry of displacement and hurt coming to full force in the 2000s. In the Sri Lankan war, there were impossibilities of return for the Muslims. So, um, in October 1990, LTT had forcefully evicted about 70,000 to 80,000 Muslims from the north in their effort to create Tamarilam. You see how Sharmila said in her um, poignantly notes um, uh, the, the losses suffered and the impossibility of return in a po poem, Keys to an Empty House, uh, where you know the house is no more, but the keys are still held on by her father. Anar writes of the pain of being uh, being being termed a traitor, which is there in Pale Manakumburudu in that anthology. Um, Anar writes about how certain losses which are so intangible, like she says how my sister's laugh was like a bird in flight. And she's, she goes on to say that, you know, her um, she she does that laughter has never been heard again because um, uh, because of war. Mm. Um, I I now want to come to the last session of my paper, which is about dissent and dissenters and their death and how a, a poetry of remembrance has come about or around them. For example, um, Rajani Tiranagama, um, who was an early supporter of LTT, but parted ways with the organization in the mid 1980s. Um, she was harassed both by the Sri Lankan army and the IPKF. Though Rajani knew her life was at risk, she refused to be cowed down uh, or leave Jaffna. She co-authored the um, very important book, Broken Palmyra, and the important still quoted um, and still studied um, chapter, No More to Your Sister, which is a feminist appraisal of the conflict. She co-founded the University Teachers for Human Rights, Jaffna, and uh, her assassination was was the intolerance that a militant organization has shown to a woman who shows the courage to express her convictions. Um, it, it, there is poetry that has come out of her death by Avai uh, and many others. Um, then there's the dissent, which is you see in the poetry by Selvi Tyagarajan, who was a member, former member of Plot. She was arrested. She was um, and disappeared without any much evidence. Um, 
then shivaramani who was a powerful uh, voice which came from jaffna and was part of sulla the saidigal and how um, when the militant uh, struggle started eating itself and then um, fighting for dominance in the ipk war what happened was there there was a retreat into misogynist thinking even in spaces of education um, where feminists were being targeted and there were uh, posters misogynist posters which came across uh, university campus trying to police the dress code of women students condemning feminists and feminism shivaramani was also personally targeted so this this brilliant woman who had written come friends let's win the world at the start of the tamil national movement now writes we got up not to change the world but to enter another darkness so there is a fatigue and on you the marks that marks both selvi's poems and shivaramani's poems which um i turned to valentine daniel's uh, work on newly freed victims of terror in sri lanka where he says that brutalities were variously enumerated uh, in flat town recitations devoid of conv uh, conviction it was not actually boredom or or but it was an overwhelming sense of sheer worthlessness of all attempts to communicate something which was so radically individuated and rendered as unshareable and it is the unshareability which is also again that we see in shivaramani's and selvi's poems uh but but what is interesting is how again something that is um front uh, flagged for us in pale manakkum bolude the afterwards there where they talk about how the uh, personal memories are intertwined with the larger by but talking about the larger political context and so you see how even when uh, avai is writing about rajini or shiva uh, sumati shivamohan is writing about um uh, uh, about shivaramani you see that there is a painful drawing of memories and talking uh, thinking about the time that they spent together etc but then it is again a vehement act of dissent in itself in itself at a time then when there was lot of censorship um recently the femcon sri lanka collective an online and on ground platform for facilitating intersectional and intergenerational feminist conversations had held a panel discussion to pay tribute to notable sri lankan feminist personalities of the past very aptly titled looking back looking ahead to interest to this paper was how noted activist sarala emmanuel who works with the surya women's development center a collective of women's activists uh, working in batikalavo district in eastern sri lanka on a remembrance of rajini emphasized on her everyday interventions in war as doctor as an activist as well as a work in solidarity and friendship building and trust so violence is also it is acknowledged it is condemned but also newer versions or newer ways of solidarity buildings that these women were involved in are recognized and are made visible so she says how the work that rajini had done um and uh, shanti sachidanandan had done had then later on has repercussions in um safe forming of kutra of uh, surya development center um, very interestingly from in her remembrance she talks about a work with this organization uh, that uh, she is a part of called tamil muslims in hala sisters and their interventions after the widespread violence after muslim uh, against muslims after the easter sunday attack we know that after the war muslims were the first minorities to bear the brunt of it the bodubala sena um, um uh, had a um, anti um, halal uh, agitation there was um, riots in alakkuma and then after the easter sunday attack they were they were widespread violence against them she talks of how in the wake of wake of this violence there was also rumors that infertility drugs were being put in their food then uh, T tms sisters she says how they came together and they cooked together they made more or butter milk and offered to devotees walking to mamangan temple interventions in how people lived in every day and she says how how to see the difference between how do we conceptualize the difference between the sacred and the profane in such context 
i found it very profound that uh, um, like uh, this was what uh, a remembrance of a feminist has led to everyday interventions um the period of militant nationalism was also marked by displacement i don't want to get into that too much uh, women uh, have written um, poetry has been written by women in diaspora talking about the difficult middle passage the violence of having to bear the burden of carrying the nation and being the ideal tamil women um uh, but also again the emergence of different solidarities like pengal sandipigal which uh, manka ma'am can uh, talk um uh, um it with more uh, knowledge um the, the which was starting in 1990s um and the um, publications they brought out i remember this one um, poem written by ardial um and um this uh, this this note that deva had written at the called suvadugal in meen pal meel parvugal and ardial writing i recognized in the marks and bruises of on all women the whiplash scar on my mother's face so how you know an act of solidarity building and um, sisterhood is also a part of tackling how um uh, tackling things about um, violence i want to end my paper with a very smart small um thinking through on abductions and disappearances because it's a different paradigm and there is no closure people are still waiting for information here i had looked at maldi de alves's work her article titled tracing the absent presence which suggests suggests that a re-inhabiting of the world in the context of forced disappearances is a constant tracing of traces given the ambiguous nature of the disappeared status of absence and thus presence she compares la capra's and butler's idea of grief grief la capra is concerned that allowing oneself to be caught up in the thrall of one's own grief is intellectually unproductive but butler on the other hand traces space for politics in the relational undoing in grief as de alves notes in this essay this undoing is both physical and psychical at the same time as we struggle for the autonomy of our bodies we are also confronted by the fact that we carry the enigmatic traces of others maldi de alves following her reading of butler points to the possibility of reconsidering her earlier work on political communities being formed under the age of motherhood and look at how political communities can be formed around grief and that is exactly what mothers of the mothers of the disappeared are doing currently in sri lanka out in the streets forming political communities around the grief um of not knowing what has happened to their loved ones keeping on pressing um for information um but it the situation is very bleak godabaya rajapaksha who had consistently opposed the demands of justice including commitments made to the un human rights council is now at the head uh, mahinda rajapaksha assuming the post of prime minister the power is firmly and disturbingly consolidating between the brothers with the increase in government surveillance the mothers of the disappeared group has reportedly been unable to hold even a public protest when the new administration asked these mothers for information about who were part of their meetings these mothers remind them of their right to information about missing persons i would always also urge all of you to um, look at the website of pearl action which documents in detail with photographs the missing and also those who have passed away the loved ones those who have passed away while waiting for the information on their loved ones remembering the disappeared remembering the violence that has happened also remembering the solidarities and sisterhoods that were formed is the only way to rage against the violence of erasure i i conclude with a poem again by yalini translated by geeta sukumaran written at the end of the war the smell of corpses spreading like smoke the smell of corpses spreading like smoke you may encounter it at any moment story of wasting bodies hair bristling wandering in the village buried under the red and quick sand of time a corpse covered lay spread out on my bed a poem ingested the body entered my throat and sifted my words flicking of fingers that extend in the dense drizzle of failed northern rain you keep walking past my corpses that lay frozen within 
unwritten words. Thank you. Thank you, Padma. Thank you so much. I think it was a very fitting tribute to Malati Diyadi, a dear friend of uh, most of us who have been interested in this field. Um, and for me, especially as somebody who has been invested in this topic in many ways, um, linked to it in, in an everyday sense, in a way um, that one has to address it. And um, many of us who were part of the uh, 80s, I mean, 70s um, generation. And uh, in Tamil Nadu, for us, it, we needed to um, take into account this part, take into account um, the role of Sri Lankan, um, Sri Lankan context, especially the ethnic conflict, because they were speaking the same language as us in Tamil Nadu. Um, so anytime you read, talk, discuss, I think it really takes you to a plane where it's very difficult to draw the line you know, between uh, the affect and the reason that one has to talk about. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think um, in a way you captured the momentum. Uh, apart from the factual details, I don't know how many of the listeners have followed closely of Sri Lankan history, which Aparna assumed, and I'm sure in the discussions it would come. Even though the war is supposed to have ended, I think uh, the way Aparna presented. Um, tells you that the traces of the war are still continuing. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot. So I think um, this study of Dr. Aparna is something very, very crucial. Because I mean, I, I really see people like, like us who are uh, bilingual or multilingual and who are um, writing in a language, like Aparna said, you know, I mean, her mother tongue is not Tamil, but she's reading Tamil poetry, and this uh, interpreting it for an academic world, which in itself is another world altogether, and in English. Um, and I think it's uh, it's a very, very difficult terrain that one is really um, traversing through. One, the journey is not really easy. And especially when it is connected to a um, long drawn out war, be it in Kashmir or Palestine or Sri Lanka, or I'm sure we're going to be talking about Syria in some senses, or the age old struggles of the first world nations, which keep coming up again and again in the discourses um, of our anthropological, cultural history and literature. You know, so the idea of um, having writing as witness or as testimony um, has this burden, has this burden of um, become, being a document, being, being a kind of document where documents are not possible. You know, I mean, uh, in a historical sense, if one is going to look for facts, I'm sure already many of those facts maps have been changed, landscapes have changed, names have been changed. Um, and like uh, Aparna was talking, you know, even just last week, you had memories and uh, memorials being demolished and renamed and, you know, it's a whole lot of other things. And um, I really loved Gauri's uh, poem that you read about, you know, I mean, the war tourism kind of thing, you know, so how, how do you really do that? And um, one must remember that in Sri Lanka with the diasporic population, with a vast diasporic population, the experience that Gauri is talking about is going to be recurrent. It's going to be something that will be there for children in Europe, Canada and others who may not be able to read Tamil, but they are Tamils. 
and who are possibly speaking multi different languages so sri lankan tamil studies if ever that comes up i think it's going to be in many languages so aparna all i mean i'm i'm glad you are understanding your um position of entry as somebody who is an outsider um but i would not call them pitfalls i would just call them as challenges and they are real challenges you know um and i think we know how to work through it we can never really just kind of uh, bypass these issues we are going to work through it so i just thought i'll flag off um one or two points and leave it open for discussion one is uh, the area that apana has talked about um yeah, focuses on poetry and poetry as a genre um has its own specificities so if you're going to be a pure if at all there is a pure literature student then i think those questions are going to come up and today like she talked about tamilinese memoir and we have so many memoirs which are coming not people who are identifying themselves as writers and sometimes even mediated through workshops through collective gatherings you know so they uh, they they it is partly therapeutic it is partly their coping mechanism for survival and um, more than poetry it's going to be prose in some form and not even fiction in many ways it's going to be so close to life stories but not necessarily autobiographical you know because even tamilinese repertoire who, who is already a writer and, and an ex combatant and who was um yeah, captured and who was captured and then spent uh, a lot of years and then also suffered illness and passed away and her memoir was published a year after her death and people are still arguing whether uh, people have um, tampered with the writing you know in the way she has recorded that document so i don't think we are even going to talk about the truth value of these writings we are only going to be talking about what does writing really give us you know in fact in, fact, in aparna's paper that she circulated she refers to anal you know she is so where she says um nan padal enak kavidey mukham you know so i am i am a song i am song and my face the poetry is my face you know which is what anar one of the major tamil muslim poets from sri lanka talks about and aparna refers to her writings so i think the question of jana and uh, i'm sure as aparna is going to be engaging with this topic for the more and i would truly truly entreat you to do that because we do need people to know about these writings uh, that are there written in tamil and there are few voices who are writing about it from within the sri lankan context these be it cheran or agilan or even sumati um but i think there are various uh, standpoints when they write so in a way i think the distance that a scholar like you have would really kind of help in bringing out in teasing out the subtler uh, differences and expression so it is going to expand and one of the ways in which it can expand is to really expand it in terms of genre in terms of um, incorporating i mean which aparna has already done whether it is chitraleka uh, sumati writes in both tamil and english and there are many more writings that come in tamil in pelmanakku bolu chitra chitraleka mamaguru actually talks about the difficulties of you know what gets published in tamil nadu like pelmanakku bolu it was so difficult to take, get it across to sri lanka to tamil speaking areas especially at that time because it was 2007 so it took about 3 4 years for this book to really reach there um so and, and then there are also mistakes that tamil speaking editors and compilers like me or krishnamini or tamilavan you know name all of us we all commit in fact even in pelmanakum bolu i later came to know that two of the women i had included in that were actually men writing in female names and then i mean chitra herself has many pseudonyms 
uh, and that becomes a necessity in times of war when you're referring to various things. So there are, it, it is a kind of very complex question. So it is good to have many voices, you know, that, that can really kind of bring up these issues. Um, I also feel the idea of, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the, uh, the idea of feminist solidarity which can be built across languages and across ethnicities. And Malati was, um, I mean, there are many. Sunila is there, Kumari is there, and you have Malati, and you mentioned Sarla, who has a very, very checkered history uh, of choosing to live in the eastern part of Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, yeah, that seminar especially was very, very deeply uh, moving. Uh, so that kind of feminist solidarity which can be built up, including the poet, you know, I mean, um, there is a, a recent volume of IR which is yet to come, which is in the pipeline called Nedu Marangalai Vardal and um, Nedu Marangalai, which he takes from Bharatiyar, you know, where you just stand unable to do anything, you know, where, where that's a usage he uses in Panjali Sabadam. Like he says, Nette Marangalai Kulambahindra, you know, so you stand and just watch. You you have you can't do anything. So that inability uh, to not be able to do uh, any of those uh, any anything that you really want to do. And what Arya see, sees as um, something that can really hold you together would be writing. Writing as conscious conscience, manasach, you know. So this is a poem called Pinnaya Vasipu. Uh, I haven't done an official translation, but uh, I can do a rough translation. So it says, Manasachi meendum meendum nalliravil elupum kadavin pinnal. Nobet inadum. Nobet is name of the writer Singaram who wrote Pudhyadhor Ularam, which was one of the earliest writings to really document the, ethnic, the beginnings of ethnic violence. Um, so no better no them rajini idea kaigal kaigalum innum tatti chorndu poi vidavilla so in other words uh singaram and rajini are tapping you know they keep knocking at the door of your conscious conscience in the middle of the night so it is the writing that really keeps our conscience alive according to ariel in this poem and then but then she also adds and she says you know, roughly, it will be the ancestral grandma's eyes whose face has the trace of suffering, still shines the ever lit lamp of Perundanmai um, can be uh, magnanimous, generous, compassion. You know, so it, it, it is still compassion. So somewhere, I think um, the idea of uh, the war and being a witness to the war and suffering um, and being the voice I and mean, having this burden to document. And I think uh, in a way, as an academician, um, Dr. Aparna has chosen to be this mediator and bearing the burden uh, of that, you know, and um, uh, I... Uh, it, it, it is not an easy, easy job, you know, like Aparna said, it's not just Manaberigal or Koneshwarigal, which is difficult to read because they are a little more graphic. But there are many other texts, you know, where they talk about um, how their birds today have a surfeit of food because through the water come so many corpses and they feed on them. You know, or you're somewhere in a land where you don't recognize the trees or the plants or the flowers that are there. Um, but, but I think women's voices have uh, less of nostalgia, more of survival, more of um, confidence, more of hope, if I can use the word hope. Um, so I think in that sense, it has always been a difficult um, uh, uh, you know, when you when you really kind of work through women's writing and, uh, you know, that ever present idea of um, how do we write women's, right? how do you include women's writing or is women's writing creating a rupture in the world of writing? You know, those questions really come up. But 
for these women, I think writing is what has kept them alive, whether in their own land or in their own homes, which is not necessarily a home anymore, uh, or somewhere else, you know, in another land, in another country, in another language. So I think uh, writing has really become uh, the anchor, the lifeboat kind of uh, feeling. And then, um, I mean, writing as late as in 2015 in a poem called Salt, um, I, I mean, Ariel doesn't write as much, you know, I, I really wanted her to be present in this meeting and we will share the recording with her. And in that she kind of, the, all the metaphors are related to ocean and waves and island and everything. And then she ends it saying, um, which ocean is going to forget the saltiness? Which mother intends to get children to fight wars? You know, so it is not, uh, the distance does not really take away the memories. It keeps it uh, alive. And I think um, um, apart from the actual memorial sites and everything, the difficulty of facing the state impunity in just remembering your own family members who are gone, you know, I mean, all of us have All Souls Day, you remember the people who are dead on every year annually, you know, the tidi that you talk about. And um, that becomes difficult. In fact, Aguilan's recent collection, which is getting translated by Gita Sugumara, uh, talks about that. So in fact, in one of the plays that we did with the Surya group, um, so they, they call, we were talking about different lamps in the house. You know, you have a kutuvelake, you have a meridipidi, you know, candlelight, you have all these kind of different lights. And then one of the lights that they talked about was um, you know, there is no corpse, there's no dead body, but it is a house of death. And you light a lamp. Now, even that lighting of lamp for remembrance has come under a lot of threat. You know, it's 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 becoming much more uh, checkered. But I think um, I mean, I describe myself always as a pathologically optimistic person. So I don't want to give in whether lockdown or you know whatever happens. I think uh, we can't afford the luxury of losing hope. You know, I mean um, that is not there for us. And um, but we do have. The luxury to reflect, we do have um, the way to really learn, respond, and do that. And I think these academic exercises, and I'm hoping Aparna's um, thesis would soon become a book, which has been my wish for a, a few years now, so it will soon come up. So when it comes up, I think it's going to be a rich collection, um, not just for South Asian studies, but also for women's writing in the rest of the world, especially women's writing in times uh, or in, in spaces of Trump, in spaces of conflict, in, in, in times of crisis. So I think um, it is something that we as academicians owe to the society around us because, you know, I mean, if you're going to keep going back to what is the role of the intellectual or the academician, I think these are what the least that we can do is to really um, flesh out and flag the issues that they have uh, documented in some form or the other in at most difficult times. So I think um, Apana's job is difficult and it is great. And I know she has um, a really good mix of academicians, poets, and uh, friends uh, across. Um, India, in Tamil Nadu, and in Sri Lanka, and that will keep her going. That will be what I think will keep her going. And I wish her all success, and I'm, I'll leave the floor open for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your great words. Yeah. Arunima? Uh, Thank you, uh, Mangai. Thanks a lot for responding to um, Aparna's rich paper. 
uh, which is a, a between her paper and your responses. I think we have uh, opened up a range of questions about form, about poetry, about the idea of witnessing, about the idea of unshareability, and what do we do with that question that keeps returning to us, especially as feminists and those who work with the kind of uh, material that we do on the issue of experience. How do we think with that? Um, you know, I, I particularly would like a, to speak a little bit more about this kind of idea of unshareability. Um, I think uh, there is something very specific to that, um, which is different, and perhaps there's a way in which she is thinking about it differently from the ways in which others who have thought about, um, you know, experience as some kind of embodied um, sort of forms of expression and political practice. So it's sort of taking it away from that. Um, so how would we think more about that? So I think there, there are really very rich areas. Uh, also, I think the question, um, and, and you know, I'm really happy Bangay brought this up because you know, this is something that increasingly most of us living in, you know, I don't think there are any sort of zones of the world anymore which we sort of demarcate as conflict areas. We are li living through conflictual times. Uh, these are really, really uh, painful, demanding, difficult times. And at times like that, the uh, sort of feeling that you've been living through civil war for four decades or more, and there is no resolution, and there are generations that have died, and there are generations that are going to be uh, sort of coming uh, in the future who are written into this past. So the idea of fatigue, I think, is again such a um, painful reminder of the ways in which we're so speaking to, you know, our um, constant kind of, you know, trying to reach out to hope. So I understand what Mange is saying. But at the same time, I also feel that there is such an uh, unbearable sense of fatigue uh, where you feel the same people, same same issues are coming up again and again. And, you know, when I had the uh, sort of, what is it, a real learning experience of reading so much of the uh, uh, poetry coming from Sri Lanka, thanks to, um, you know, Aparna's thesis, one of the things that struck me was the extraordinary and early kind of candor of being able to speak to this question of violence within the community. So it wasn't as though it was a kind of perpetrator versus victim kind of text that was being laid out. There was actually, on the contrary, there was a really, really important way by which they were very early on turning the lens back. So, uh, you know, even though you are speaking about the violence of India and you're speaking about the violence of the top, uh, sort of Sri Lankan state, but you're also able to speak about intra-combatant violence. You're able to speak about intra-familial violence. How do you speak about the fact that the husband and the shopkeeper and, every, and the policeman, there's this kind of spectrum of gazes by which the woman's body is being sort of shaped and you know, molded and reduced. And, and there's a kind of speechlessness that comes from that, which is what this poetry is putting into words. So what is actually really remarkable, Aparna, is the fact that we have in words a speaking about wordlessness. So how do we actually um, you know, bring a certain kind of intellectual and political lens onto those kinds of ideas when we read it at times like these. So it would be ha very nice to hear you respond to uh, the very rich range of questions and thoughts that Mange had raised for you and some of these. And may I request all other uh, uh, participants of this workshop uh, uh, presentation, paper presentation, to type in their questions so that we will make it simpler by reading it out to Aparna. Uh, and she could respond to those. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for those comments. And thank you, Manka, ma'am, also for responding. 
uh, to my paper. Um, uh, the question of um, the question of genre uh, that Manga Ma'am has um, put forward, I find it very fascinating as well as challenging for me right now because poetry. Um, like a good friend of mine who's, I think, here, Agastya had once told that uh, poetry is a language of its own, um, in its own, which she understands. And that sort of, um, it's still in my mind when she said, you know, what she said. So sometimes there are certain genres which you understand much better, and especially when I'm falling out of the language. But also, I find that this might be a great moment for me to look for um, collaborative work. In a certain way, where you know, um, like um, what what I can put. Obviously, collaboration again comes with its own politics and its own power structures, etc. As seen in the recent Deepa Mehta whole issue. Um, so that is again a question that I I will deal with. But thank you for fronting it out that the whole life life stories, memoirs. I read how Netra Rodriguez in Cheren had sort of um, in the preface to Tamarini's memoir had taken this question of genre and well, Netra was saying that, you know, memoir should be uh, sort of expanded to include even even poetry and th that was an idea that you know struck me yes why you know even genres can be uh, malleable and uh, these are concepts that we have made and how to go through it but of course that would need a different kind of um, equipped equipment and uh, a different kind of um, challenge like you like you put forth um, I am so struck by this poetry written mediated through workshops in fact you know today i uh, i think today would be a good day to talk about this um when i had visited maladi ma'am in sri lanka she had given me the small booklet which was um arunima ma ma'am also knows this uh, which was about mothers uh front and mothers groups and there were a lot of poems in it which was commune in in was which was written together so there was just Mother friend, mother friend. So the, it it was not the identity is of the collectivity, and together as a collectivity they have authored something. And um, uh, the uh, the um, question that um, Arunima ma'am had um, mentioned about unshareability could be actually something we can uh, read together with this um, idea of poetry as therapeutic work as well. How how does how how why is it the medium through which which is uh, which people who have gone through war has written in because even in pale manakum burida sitrilega monoru says that you know people have lost it was like they like obviously you're leaving everything the, your belongings and running away in the midst of it you can't run away with your poems but you come back you try to f f fish it out and when you can't you write from memory so there is that there that sort of uh, uh, it, it is this witnessing is so important for them. Even Banu Bharati, she writes about the uh, in the preface uh, to Piratiyal, I think, where uh, she uh, talks about how you know, in running to bunker, sometimes you know she would take letters written to friends or come come. Those are the most important documents. So uh, documentation again. Like uh, uh, Pradeep Jagannathan's important work on anticipation of violence and Siddharth and Maunaguru's um, um, uh, uh, engagement with this work, which is the sort of effect that people have with documents living through war. And can can poetry be then be a document? And the unshareability question is so important. Um, the idea of fatigue, um, uh, that was again something... Um, in that femcon um, uh, conference uh, when rajini was being remembered by her um, a small snippet was being shared about her remembrance by her daughter she she said narmada she said that how her mother was was never tired of the fight that was what kept her uh, uh, different you know, so that was what was imp imbibed to the next uh, generation, which again, Sarala Emanuel's work, etc., is beautifully taken forward. This idea of 
you you feel the fatigue like in selvi's works and shivaram but these people kept writing even in shivaram's work the uh, you see how you know even when uh, there was lot of lament of the time that is lost there's again a glimmer of hope where she's saying that i'll be like that small star which uh, between your fingers which you cannot catch so so um it 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 would be something that i can work forward with and um true like how they have started with the community in the 80s when you're thinking about a uh, forming a different nation uh for yourself uh you're fighting the fight you would want to keep so much a secret but these women were that was not where they started that is a lesson for all of us in our personal lives and in our political lives to shun silence of that sort um um i will keep um all the comments that i've got today and i'll rework on it i'll keep thinking on it especially regarding genre and unshareability much further thank you actually i think there is that poem on maunam that you mentioned no and forgetting the author where she talks about that it is the silences that become poetry you know in a, so in many ways i think somewhere uh, the silences and the gaps uh, actually become uh, the you know in one of uh, vijayalakshmi's poem she says samudayathin nisattamo bayangara irechalai something in nimmadiye kedukirathu you know so it is it is that silence which which is actually love <laughs> and and that that somehow it enables a sh- shareability you know uh in some ways the pauses the gaps and everything thank you all i also think that you know we because i mean just to go back to this question of where we all are you know even say a decade back or a couple of decades back i think the subcontinental political situation was slightly different now i think uh, things are just horrible everywhere <laughs> there is again a need to lead out across borders and boundaries and build and rebuild and perhaps that's what a younger generation of feminists is doing now i think it's extremely important to bring back those linkages which i certainly people of my generation or older will remember uh having the you know having been connected to feminist friends uh both uh, whether they were in academics and actually i think the boundaries there were also not so tight i mean you would have been part of political groups and you may have been there in the classroom or you may have been a cultural uh sort of somebody who was culturally active and uh, certainly in sri lanka one can see that i mean i i i know so many artists for example uh who's work uh, you know people work with uh, uh, words and visuals and you know there are ways in which they think about that i had uh, an extraordinary experience of being able to actually hear cheren uh live last year when he had come to the kerala literary festival in korikod um and it's soon after that that um, you know covid started and the lockdown started and so on um so i think it is actually a moment where perhaps one can have uh, productive kinds of um you know uh, relationships forged once again uh and i think intellectual work is so important i mean we constantly uh, feel guilty uh, about intellectual labor but there is an enormous amount uh, that can be done with intellect work especially if it's put out there for people to read and also for people to teach with and you know for us to sort of redo ways in which we think about classroom so thank you very much aparna it was an excellent talk thank you in fact um the mothers of the disappeared you know like aparna was describing um i mean vasugi who did the painting for pelmanakkum and she is one of our early painters uh, that aparna also talks about arundhati and vasugi 
so now what the what Vasuki is doing is to work with these mothers on saris and they paint the shape of the women and give the details of the person the day they were lost from which part and all that so it is it is literally converting the idea of your body as a map and to give it uh, you know and to do it on uh, so it's a I, I, I really think we, uh, along, it, it is a way of healing and one has to really think of healing. So however, uh, I mean, I, I get the word fa fatigue, you know, loud and clear. <laughs> but I'm also thinking the way people are looking at whether it is uh, anti-CAA struggle or the farmer's struggle now, I'm thinking how, how a library becomes part of the struggle space. Uh, uh, langar becomes part of the struggle space. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. So there is a way in which I think we are imagining an ethics of care in struggle. You know, so uh, so in a way, it is it is kind of um, it it is a healing. It is, it is the healing that is going to keep us um, going with all the fatigue that we are going through. You know, so when one falls, the other gives a shoulder. Yeah. Would you like to read out the comments, please? Yes. yes. Um, um, hi, Aparna. We have a, a few appreciatory remarks for your talk. And uh, I would read out this one comment from, uh, I think, the person is um, SL Poetry. That's the name written. Uh, I'm researching and identifying sites of trauma within poems themselves and the effect of these sites on the translators who experience them in such a visceral way. Your paper was so informative and rich in bibliographic material. Would you like to add something on to that particular aspect? Um, um, Geeta Sukumarin's work, um, I think, deals a lot with... Uh, the idea of trauma and uh, within poetry. And you are right. Um, I mean, there are a lot of poems which are, like Mangai Ma'am was saying, it's very difficult to read because um, you have like blood notes by um, Anar or um, the idea of um, a mental breakdown mapped on to poems and uh, talking of corpses, co uh, talking about. Um, uh, uh, being uh, removed from reality, um, it it is difficult. But I wouldn't say it on the translators, um, but readers. And I think that is what poetry is trying to do. Also, like the whole unshareability question comes again. Like uh, the uh, the the term that Shivati, uh, Sumati Shivamohan had used when she was talking to me was about translationality of experience. Aparna, maybe you can learn the language, but how will you? how will you cross over that bump so so how why are we getting affected reading translations you know like what transpires to us through poetry and how is it different perhaps from other genres is is a is a question which is very interesting and i would um shash trevet i'm working with uh, your so again i'll be looking forward to read your work Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Uh, we um, have a few messages appreciating your talk from Jinu GV um, and Hamida CK um, also. But uh, there are no further queries in the chat box. Uh, Professor Arunima, shall we conclude the session? Sure. And I think perhaps uh, we can continue our conversations outside of this formal kind of space and if people want to get together and talk about uh, war and poetry and other such things we can certainly try and get together and do that because i think that's so needed in these times and i fully agree with mangai that you know we are really looking at so many new kinds of sites uh, of protest and resistance but also of extraordinary kinds of uh, I mean, I'm always thrown by the kinds of cultural energy, uh, which, for instance, the farmers' protest is a great example once again, 
of uh, how that's brought together, you know, brought, brought out all forms of uh, cultural forms of resistance, which don't necessarily map onto the ways in which, say, speeches or prose might position itself. So once again, what a pleasure to listen to a talk on poetry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Arunima. Pleasure. Such a pleasure. Bye, Mangai. Talk to you soon. Yes. Bye.